uh, those that are tuning in on the web uh, to hear all about identity on the web. My name is Justin Smith. I work at Microsoft. I work on the Access Control Service team, which is part of Azure, the Azure platform, and also part of App Fabric. We have lots of homes. Um, I'm the lead PM on that team. I've been working in this space for quite a while, and I'm super excited to be here today. I've got a lot of really cool stuff to show you. Um, I hope uh, that you walk away from this with a bunch of new things. Um, and I believe that this session will make your day. We'll see about that. Um, <clears throat> when you start to think about identity, there's some stuff that probably pops into your head, in particular about uh, identity on the web. And I'd like to walk through what some of those things are. I think a lot of them are going to be familiar to you in the audience. Um, but let's just see. One of the first things you got to think about is how you're going to authenticate your users, right? How is a user going to log into your site or your service? Um, do you care about things like federated login or accepting an identity from some third party like OpenID, et cetera? Uh, when you start going down that path, you start thinking, well, there's a bunch of different protocols that are out there in the wild. I've got OpenID, that's prolific. I've got Facebook, that's absolutely huge. SAML for enterprise identity, and you've got WS Star also for, for enterprise identity. So there's a bunch of these things. But you can't really stop there because all these protocols version over time. So when you're thinking about how you would integrate with any of these entities, you always have to think about vNext. So like what is OpenID vNext? There's a new working group spun up thinking about that. Facebook has a tendency to change some stuff, right? If you think back a couple of years, there was this thing called Facebook Connect. Now they're on, now, now they're on to OAuth. You know, what's next? Who really knows, right? You gotta think about single sign-on across multiple sites. Maybe you're not just building one site, maybe you're building a set of sites. And how is a user going to be authenticated across a bunch of those different sites? Next thing, well, what if I want to add some additional factor? Like when a user logs in, you see this a lot at a bank. They log in and you show them a picture of a lamp or a desk or some additional factor to say, OK, this is actually you. Right? A lot of interesting twists and turns there. When a user logs in, what do you do with their user profile? Are you going to request additional data from the user when they register? How are you going to store that? How are you going to keep it versioned? Where are you going to get the data from? Lots of interesting questions there. If you're trusting a bunch of identity providers like OpenID, Google, Yahoo, et cetera, how do you deal with the maintenance of that trust? So there may be some cryptographic material that needs to be refreshed over time. That's a fun and interesting and fascinating topic in and of itself. Uh, certainly, you can't ignore mobile. Mobile is enormous, right? There's a big chunk of mix that's dedicated to mobile. So how is this going to work on a mobile phone or a mobile device? Well, you can't just stop about thinking of a mobile device. It's like, well, there's a bunch of different mobile devices out there. You got Android, you got Windows Phone 7, you have all your eyes, right? So you got your iPhone, you got your iPad, i, et cetera, right? How is it going to work across all those different devices? Because you need reach into a bunch of different platforms. Non-trivial problem. If you're going to write a mobile application, you're probably going to have some web services. How are you going to secure those web services? How are you going to deal with the protocols on the left-hand side of the screen in a web service? That's a lot of fun. Uh, let's think about, are your web services REST, or do you have some SOAP services, maybe new SOAP services or SOAP legacy services? How are you going to have a common mechanism across both those sets of services? Lots of fun stuff coming up here. Um, maybe this got truncated. Nope, just on my screen. You've probably got infrastructure, right? So your site and service is going to be sitting there running. You've probably got a logging trace dump that you're going to be able to, some people need to be able to log into. Uh, you could have things like tier-to-tier -tier or server-to-server -server style communication. Maybe you have a fairly deep set of infrastructure. How are you going to handle authentication across all that infrastructure? If you're using SQL or maybe using NoSQL or maybe using Azure Table Store or something like that, how do you auth into those back-end services? That's a lot of fun as well. How do you deal with managing any keys that you're going to use over the service, right? So are you going to bake them into the application? If you bake them into the application when you deploy it, how are you going to secure the key when you're deploying it and make sure that your whole dev team doesn't have access to your production keys? That's another good one. Uh, we got some more that can come up. And these can just continue and continue, right? Are you dealing with passwords? So when you're authenticating to your back-end services, are you dealing with passwords? Are you dealing with symmetric keys? Are you dealing with X509 certificates? Are you dealing with elliptic curve credentials? Who knows, right? Lots of things there. If you have users, maybe those users are going to grant your site or your service access to other things. That's called delegation. So you could have delegation scenarios. And as soon as you start thinking about delegation and REST web services, something that might pop into your mind is OAuth, something that I know and love. 
And as soon as you start to think about OAuth, do you think about OAuth 10A or do you think about OAuth 2.0? Fun stuff. And last but not least, there's this big question around authorization. So inside your site and services, how do you deal with who has access to what? Make sense? These are all pretty, I, I, the, these are all common topics. I think you guys have tried to wrestle with this before. And my assertion is that, if my clicker works here, all that stuff's pretty straightforward and we really don't have a whole lot to talk about here. I know you guys took a chunk of your day to come and listen to you know, some new ideas around identity, but uh, I really appreciate your time. I hope you all go out and enjoy some refreshments because we don't have a whole lot to talk about. Have a great day. Everyone knows I'm joking, right? The reality is when you start to think about these topics, you get, it appears as a giant twisted knot, right? And I actually got this image from a, a, a royalty-free site, and this was all about mental uh, problems, like insanity, right? And so this image, I think, connotes how most developers feel about those topics that were on that earlier slide. It's confusing, it's hard to make sense of, you're not really sure how to tackle this big giant ball of stuff. And what I'm here to do today is to help you untangle some of what I believe are the more critical aspects of those, those aspects to building web services and websites. Now, I've heard a guy at uh, Google named Brian Eaton describe these topics as juggling chainsaws, right? It's really hard to practice, and when you get it wrong, the cost can be severe, right? And so I'm gonna lead you through some approaches that we take inside of Microsoft and some of the services that my team builds, the service that my team builds, and how it helps you approach these problems without you having to try to reinvent the wheel. And so as you look at this big giant ball of, of stuff, you often will want to think about, or at least the way I approach hard problems, is I try to, to separate items into sets. So I try to lo logically group problems into just groups of problems. It's so much easier to think about it that way. And I wanted desperately to put labels on how I think of the identity and the security space on this Venn diagram, and I wanted to be really careful about how I was going to overlap these different entities, but the reality is there's not broad agreement over how you dissect this space. Some thinks it's authentication and authorization and maybe identity management. Others believe that online reputation is really important and so that's like a whole thing in and of itself. It clearly is. But my point in showing you a Venn diagram is not to talk about all the different segments and how they overlap, but really in the services space, we at Microsoft have only been able to provide to date a very narrow band or a very narrow solution to this problem space, right? We have been out front and doing a lot of interesting work around securing REST web services and single sign-on, but the first version of the access control service and the tooling around it and the other capability in the Azure platform was very narrow. So there's a bunch of different solutions that are available inside of Azure, and really you had to piece together quite a bunch of stuff yourself. And if you heard the keynote this morning, you know that there is a new version of the access control service that is in production in six data centers with 24-7 ops and monitoring around it. And that new version, I believe, is a massive improvement over what we had in the first version of the access control service. It brings to bear things like the Visual Studio developer experience, the tooling that's available in Windows Identity Foundation. It integrates cleanly with some data management tools. It gives you a lot of extra power that the first version of the service just didn't have, right? And so that first version of the service, we had to make a lot of really tough decisions around how we were going to ship and the feature sets we were gonna ship. And this is a version of the service that I'm very proud to stand before you today to talk about because I believe it addresses a large set of problems. However, it's not the full set, right? And so as I think about where I want to go in my mind, I think it's all rainbows and unicorns, right? And so I can give you an entire picture where everything is happy. You don't have to really do any kind of work or lift a finger. It just kind of all works end to end. We're not there yet. We're working on it. And the story that I can tell today has some gaps in it, right? And so we have a lot of really good things to talk about, but we're a ways away from being able to address that whole problem space. And so what we'll do today is hone in on the things that I think we do really well, right, and sort of talk about the direction that the service is heading and where we're going and with Microsoft in general in this, in this big space. Make sense? All right. So first thing we'll talk about is website authentication. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and the idea here is not unique necessarily to websites, 
but it's an approach that we're taking and it's very clear how it fits in with websites. You could take the same approach for mobile applications, I'll show that in a demo, uh, and you can also apply the same approach in services as well. Right? And this is all about identifying who the user is. So let's first talk about what the de facto approach or the standard approach is on the web when you want to go build a website. Right? And that's you, you go out and you create a new username and password store. Doesn't matter if you're using ASP.NET or PHP or any of the frameworks that are out there, they all have modules that allow you to accept a new username and a password on your site. Right? And so you get a profile page and you get you know, the log in, log out kind of button and you get some session management along with it. This model is really all about the site being its own identity provider. So the credentials that, are, that you use to log into a site are unique to that site, right? They're not, you, they're not being, you're not relying on some third party to log users in for you. Now this is all fine and well and good if you think about it in a very small scope. But when you, when you broaden the scope out and say this is essentially how the internet is today, users end up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these isolated usernames and passwords. Now some say that's not bad. I say it's actually quite bad. It annoys me, right? When I want to go use a site, if they ask me to go create a new username and password and fill out a new profile store, I really have to want to use the site before I'll do that. In fact, I turn away from quite a few. And I'm not, I'm not alone. Now I'm weird in this space, like I have a lot of opinions around how this should work. But other sites that are starting to shy away from this and rely on third parties are finding out that their registration uptake is vastly improved when they allow people to log in with additional identities, right? And so I give this kind of the frowning man sort of grade. It's not an F by far, but it's just kind of a frowning man because it generally annoys me. There's another approach. It's kind of a click stop ahead. And that's where you rely on a single third party to do the authentication of the user for you, right? If you guys have been to live.visitmix.com, you've seen that you can log in with a live ID, right? And so live.visitmix.com relies on live ID. It's pretty simple to build. It's pretty simple for users to do, assuming you have a live ID that you want to use on that site. If you don't have a live ID that you want to use on that site, it can be a little bit annoying because now you have to go out and get an additional live ID and you have to go fill out that whole form and you have to fill out a CAPTCHA and it's kind of a thing. Sometimes the CAPTCHAs are really hard to interpret and you end up doing it twice and sometimes when you don't fill it out quite right, it gives you an error page and loses all your information. Like there's just a bunch of stuff involved in here. And so this is a better approach because you're relying on a hardened third service to do the login for the site, like live.visitmix.com. But in my mind, it's not quite utopia yet. There's a better model that is still shy of utopia, but it gives users choice. And that is where a site integrates with a bunch of different identity providers. You can, you, you can integrate with any identity provider or you can integrate with a finite set of identity providers. Among the OpenID community, there's pretty broad uh, uh, differences of opinion around how this should work. But the idea is the site developer can essentially say, yes, I want to accept 10 different identities from 10 different identity providers, right? Maybe they're Google, Yahoo, MyOpenID, Live ID, et cetera. Maybe Facebook as well, maybe Twitter, right? So I don't believe this is quite the utopian view of the world, but it certainly is a huge step forward of where, the, in, in my mind, the internet is today. The big point here is not so much around <clears throat> how many identity providers do you use, do you allow late bound registration, or is there sort of a, a white list that you have to be on to get on the site? In my mind, the biggest problem here is user experience, right? So the user experience of how that choice is surfaced to the website visitor is critical, right? If this site is jarring and presenting, let's say, the choice in a really difficult to understand way, right, you'll see that user retention starts to fall off and your registrations don't pick up. But there's a couple of ways that you can simplify this. Um, and so I've got a, couple, a picture of a couple of sites here that uh, do this what I think is reasonably well. Uh, and we'll walk through those in just a minute. But I think this is, the, this is an approach that has legs. It, it has a couple of years on it. And this is an approach that you might find in your own sites and services gives you better retention through the registration process if you offer users choice. All right, so let me walk you through a really simple demo of uh, a couple of sites that are using this. 
make sure I hit the right one. Okay. So the first one I'm going to go to is a, is a Silverlight-based game called Atlantis Online. Uh, it's a really interesting game. I've, I've been playing it a little bit, uh, but it's built by the Angry Toy Factory, um, and it's a strategy game. And so when you go to this site, you see that you can log in as you're going to register for the site or come back and you want to log in after you've previously registered. And so you've got a set of buttons to pick from. Right? The choice is pretty obvious. Do you want to log in with Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Windows Live ID, or Atlanta Security? Now, if you think about these identity providers for just a second, you see, well, wow, Facebook and Google are probably different protocols. In fact, they are. Google uses OpenID. Facebook uses OAuth. Live ID is kind of a different beast as well. Right? And so this site had a couple of options. One, it could go out and try to integrate with those identity providers natively, or it could use a third-party service to try to facilitate that. And the guys at uh, Atlantis Online used the access control service to facilitate this. And the rest of this talk is really around how you go do this, how you go manage it, and some other interesting thing that you can, things that you can do using the access control service. So let me just show you the login experience. It's pretty simple and straightforward. If I click on a Google button, I'm taken to the Google login page. This could be done in a pop-up as well. It doesn't really matter. I know the Google credentials that I want to use. And so I'm going to go ahead and enter them. And I'm taken right back to the Atlantis site. Now, this is a fairly intensive game, and it'll take just a second for it to load. Um, and while that thing is loading, I'm going to take you to a friend of mine's blog. So Aaron Smolser is a, a program manager on the team. And he put together a WordPress plugin that offered this kind of choice. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with WordPress. It's a PHP-based application. And so he propped up this very simple WordPress site uh, in GoDaddy, right? And if you want to log in to this site, you click the login button down at the bottom, and you're taken to what is the traditional WordPress page. But Aaron went out and built a module for WordPress that offered or extended this default login experience to allow some choices. So you got Live ID, Google, Yahoo, and Facebook. And so I can click Google, and because in this browser session, I've already logged in with Google. I have single sign-on across two different applications, and those applications don't know anything about each other. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward, right? It just kind of works. And now I can go uh, to Aaron's blog, and I can leave another comment. And I'm logged in as me, right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> the amount of code that's required to do this is trivial. In fact, if you're using Visual Studio and you're using Azure and Windows Identity Foundation, you can do this with literally zero code, right? So it's a function of just a few minutes of using the service and getting familiar with some of the tooling, the Visual Studio tooling, and you can have this up and running. Very simple, very straightforward. Now, one thing I do want to show you about the Atlantis Online uh, site is it allows you to build basically cities and go to war with other cities. And I've built my little city here. I've got uh, a palace. And then I decided to put a foundry right next to the palace because maybe I want to go smelt things. And then uh, there's a temple over here because you can never be too uh, far away from a temple. And then this is the deity that I, in theory, worship. Pretty cool stuff. It's a fun game to play. Um, I encourage you guys to keep an eye out for Angry Toy Factory. Right? Make sense? So that's the kind of experience that I think is the most viable one right now for authenticating users on sites. And so the question is really, how does this work, and how do you go do that? One thing I should mention, I don't think it came out in the keynote this morning, but all the stuff that I'm going to show you today, the access control service, the thing that is now out in production in six data centers around the world, is free of charge till the remainder of 2011. So all the stuff that I'm going to be using today is as a, promotional office, uh, as a promotional offer, free for you guys to go use now in your applications. Now, at the end of 2011, the charge is going to be trivial. It's $1.99 for 100,000 transactions, right? So if you had a million transactions through the Access Control Service, it's simply 10 times $1.99, right? It's a trivial amount of money. The idea is, uh, uh, on the ACS team, we want the service to be out of your way. It's incumbent on us to give you the technology to go create better experiences on the web that are less jarring to your users. So we don't want cost to be one of the things that keeps you away from using this approach. So I think that's pretty cool. 
No applause. Giving away free stuff. Okay. It's perhaps not the best business model in the world, but I think it's a compelling story. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit on how this works, the website authentication. If I can, my clicker works here. Oh, come on. So there's a, there's a core flow that works, uh, that, that the browser uses with the, your site and the access control service. It's really simple, straightforward. So I've got four participants in this sequence diagram, the browser, your website, the access control service, and the identity provider. So the idea is that a user at your browser performs a get on some resource. We're all familiar with that. The website returns some HTML and some script. The contents of that HTML response consist of a JavaScript source request that goes out to the access control service and says, give me a list of the identity providers that are configured for this ACS tenant, for that site. Right? That's one way to look at it. And that data is returned as a JSON array. And so there's a bunch of context in that JSON array, like what's the login URL, what's the logout URL, et cetera. What's the name of the identity provider? There's a bunch of stuff in that JSON array. But the HTML and the script that was returned in the first response simply uses that array to render the identity providers however you decide to do it, right? So if you're a PHP person, you can use whatever capability you have inside of your stack to go render whatever type of page you feel is appropriate for your users. So you're in complete control over what that login experience looks like. You can do two tabs, one behind the other. You can have a set of buttons that looks like the side of a NASCAR, for those that aren't uh, from the US. You know, it's the US equivalent of like a Formula One. Right, so you can have a bunch of stickers. Maybe you want to show three logos and maybe five. You're in control of that, right? So you render the identity providers, and then the user will click on one of those buttons, or they'll enter, they'll, they'll do something with what you've rendered. The next thing that happens is you perform a get, where the get is targeted at the identity provider. And that get has a set of query string parameters that give the identity provider context in where to return data, right? And so each identity provider can be a little bit different, like Google has one mechanism, Live ID has another, et cetera, but we in the access control service take care of abstracting that away from you, the web developer, because you probably don't want to get in that business. And so I've left off some of the 302s and exactly how this is flowing from this point forward, but after you get the selected identity provider, the user logs in however they're going to log in, probably entering their username and password. Then the identity provider returns a token uh, in whatever format that it uses, right? So if it's OpenID, there's a specific format there. Facebook has a different mechanism. LiveID has a different mechanism. But the identity provider issues a token, and it ends up at the access control service. The access control service validates that token and then creates a new token. And the contents of that token are driven by the configuration in the access control service. And I'll drill more into that in just a few minutes. And that ACS issued token is returned to your site. So your site gets basically the same token independent of whatever identity provider the user used to log in. Make sense so far? After the website gets that token, it's going to validate that token. And then it's going to return some kind of a response back to the user along with however it's going to handle its session state. So maybe it takes that token and shreds it into a session cookie. Uh, maybe it mints its own session cookie and writes the token to some store. I mean, there's a few different approaches that you could take here. They have pros and cons. A Couple interesting things to point out. Using this approach, you can integrate with Google, Yahoo, Live ID, any Open ID provider, Facebook, or ADFS v2. This list is going to expand. So right here, what you're doing, if you integrate with the access control service, you're getting reach into a bunch of different identity providers, those that are prevalent on the web, as well as those that are prevalent for enterprises. So we're bringing those two worlds together from an identity perspective and trying to make them look pretty similar. Right? So you could literally have a site that is serving both consumers and also businesses, and big businesses, businesses that have federation servers and teams that are dealing with security and things like that. So it's a pretty powerful capability. The access control service can mint three different types of tokens today. It can mint SAML tokens, mint SAML 2.0 tokens, and these things called simple web tokens. I'll show you a couple of those in just a few minutes and some token porn. And then the other interesting thing here is the website can be built with any kind of module, right? So I showed you that there, this works in PHP. 
right? So we're not demanding some heavyweight kind of library to go validate these tokens. If you're using simple web tokens, you can validate them really simply. And if you're using Windows Identity Foundation, there's literally zero code to get this up and running. So it's pretty slick. Trust model is really important. And the notion of a trust model may be a little bit foreign, but it drives home, the picture drives home the idea that your site is shielded from all the different trusts that it may want to create or the, the experiences it may want to create for its users, right? So what the access control service is essentially doing is saying, we will federate with ADFS, we will federate with Google, we will federate with Yahoo, we will federate with Facebook, and we will be the single point of trust. So your application just has to trust the access control service and we'll go deal with the rest of the integration. Now clearly there's some work that you end up doing on the website and maybe through our APIs uh, to set up that configuration, but our goal is to make that as simple and easy to do as possible. But just establishing the trust isn't quite enough and maintaining those trusts isn't quite enough. There's a, there's a notion of data normalization that's really important, right? So Live ID is going to issue one set of data back to the access control service. It's gonna be a unique ID to the user. Google is going to give you a name and maybe the email address, and maybe also some unique identifier. So just taking that data and sending it back to the site is not enough because you sh you're not really shielded from the differences in the identity providers because they return different stuff. Facebook certainly returns a bunch of different stuff. And so the idea in ACS is we don't just shield you from the basic trust fabric there. What we do is we say, we'll take data from the identity providers like what's the username, what's the email address, what's a unique ID to that user that's logged in. And we'll allow you to set up rules that transform that data such that you get a normalized data stream back to your service. And this is important when you're thinking about dealing with profile stores. So even if you're not going to ask the user to fill out their name and their address and their date of birth and all that kind of stuff, you're still gonna want a record in a profile store, probably in your site, that says, okay, this user has registered and I may have some billing relationship with them or I may have some relationship where I want their email address and I wanna be able to reach out and touch them later. And so you need a consistent chunk of data to come back through the authentication pipeline so that you have a consistent way to look up the user in your own store, right? So we offer some normalization capabilities or transformation capabilities in ACS as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the identity providers return slightly different stuff. One of the things that is common across all the identity providers though is they generally give you a unique ID for that user. And that unique ID is really, really important. I see people get tripped up on this pretty consistently. So the idea with the unique ID is that when you log in to an identity provider, like let's say Google, one of the pieces of data that is in that authentication request is actually the site that Google is going to redirect you to. And it turns out that the site and the interaction that we talked about is actually the access control service. And so it creates a unique ID for that user specific to the site. In this case, it's your ACS service namespace. And that unique ID is not globally unique, right? So it could be that someone comes up with, an, with a scheme where you get this incidental collision, where the identity that is issued by that identity, that claim that is issued by the identity provider is not globally unique, you actually end up with a collision, and that could cause all kinds of problems. So one of the things I wanna to mention to you is that when you think about the data that ACS returns, don't just think about that unique ID, you need to combine it with some handle to the identity provider that's configured in the access control service. And so the combo or the tuple of the identity provider name plus the unique ID that the identity provider issues is something that should be good enough for you to use as a primary key or some kind of key in your own data store. So there's a couple of examples that are, that are up on the screen. Um, and these are actually uh, uh, combos when I log into Google and when I log into Yahoo and when I log into Facebook. Notice that the left-hand side of the tuple or the leftmost member is actually just Google or Yahoo. Don't forget the exclamation point. They get a little angry. Um, <clears throat> and then there's Facebook. And Facebook has this hyphen because uh, the, the, when you integrate with Facebook, you're actually integrating with apps in Facebook. And so the number that's to the right-hand side of the Facebook string is actually the app ID, right? So you wanna keep this kind of squared away as you're thinking about how to go 
uh, integrate with your own profile store. You need to have that unique handle to a user. Um, now, ACS will add this data to tokens that it issues. So by default, when you, when you go through the standard setup experience, ACS automatically adds this stuff to the tokens that it issues. So you just have to go look for two claims inside of tokens. Pretty simple and straightforward to do. And WIF exposes this to you, or Windows Identity Foundation exposes this to you through uh, a, a type, right? So there's a whole object model inside of WIF, and one of those types is, you know, Microsoft.IdentityModel.Claims.Claim. So there's a set of claims. There's an innumerable of claims that's available. Really interesting point I want to drive home. I know I mentioned it earlier, but Home Realm Discovery is something where you really want to spend some time thinking about what that experience is. There's a fair amount of uh, research that's available out on the web and some interesting results around how you should and shouldn't approach this problem. Um, the idea is if you are rendering your JSON feed or rendering the selection of how a user can pick the identity provider and you get them wrong, I think the image is pretty appropriate. Users feel like the application's almost attacking them. It's like a jarring, sort of horrible experience. Right? So you can offer too many choices. You could offer 30 or 40 choices. No one can get through that. And so you want to try to try to constrain it to maybe three to five choices. And you may also have to integrate with your existing username and password store. Right? So if you've already got a couple of million users, or maybe you have a thousand users, or whatever the number is, you may have your own username and password store. So you want to integrate that choice with the existing mechanism that you had. And that's what we did with the WordPress site. Right? We tried to make it really clean and simple and easy to understand. And so you can mix and match this however you want. And I believe that for now, you guys are the best choice, or the, you, you guys are the judge and the jury about what your users expect and the kind of experience that they will um, embrace. And so I encourage you to think about that. I've shown you a couple of examples. I'll show you a few more as we work, walk through the presentation. And what ACS does here, in addition to arbitrating the trust and in addition to uh, normalizing data, is we try to make it really easy for you to render that Home Realm Discovery um, experience however you see fit, right? And so we give you that JSON feed. We give you the JSON feed in a way that it should be pretty easy to cobble together whatever HTML that you, that you choose, whatever the look and feel is. Um, and we don't just force you to create a bunch of buttons, as you've seen. If you're integrating with the consumer identity providers like Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and Live ID, you may also, your, your, your business may change and you may start selling to businesses or maybe you're already in that business, right? And so you're gonna sell to Microsoft and you're gonna sell to Toyota. You don't wanna have a button on your site that says log in here with your Microsoft credentials, log in here with your Toyota credentials. Instead, what you wanna do is have some additional mechanism, maybe it's based off of email, so Microsoft.com or Toyota.com. Right? where you take that text box and you use the domain of the user's email address to say, all right, I'm going to go to the Microsoft Federation server, I'm going to go to the Toyota Federation server. Make sense? So we give you some facility to simplify that Home Realm discovery using email address as well. So let me walk you through a really quick demo of how easy this coding experience is. I hope some of you guys are skeptical about how simple and easy to do this is. Um, and I hope that your minds are at ease after seeing this. So there's my little strategy game. Um, I'm going to start with a very simple ASP.NET MVC site. There is nothing fancy going on here. I just went file, project, new, MVC, application. Um, and I dropped a very simple control onto the page. And Vittorio, who's in the audience, the guy with the really long hair, wrote the control. Um, it's pretty straightforward. All it does is just take the security token that the app will get and render it in a set of HTML tables. We're just going to use that for some debugging and diagnostics purposes. But if I start this site, you'll see that nothing really fancy is happening here. I just render the default page, and if I click my little button here, it says you're not authenticated. Do you have to go log in and do some extra work? So one of the things that we're going to do to set this up is I'm going to show you the experience for how you take a site and integrate it with the Access Control Service. It's pretty simple and straightforward. If you have the tooling installed, Windows Identity Foundation, you can right-click the project and say Add STS Reference. It's going to ask you for the URI of the application. I'm going to enter that. So it's localhost, and that's the port gives me a warning that I'm not using HTTPS. 
And then it says, where is the service or the server that you want to integrate with? Where's the thing that you want to trust that's going to issue tokens? Well, here, what you do is you can add a URL for the access control service. And so in my clipboard, I have my access control service right here, my Fed metadata URL. So earlier today, I was having some issues with copy and paste. Thank you. No working. I'm going to try this one more time. Okay. All right, so I'm going to type it because it's fun. I'm not going through remote desktop, but I appreciate the suggestion. Uh, all right. All right, so the URL is uh, pdcwalkthrough.accesscontrol.windows.net, and then there's this thing, uh, this well-known path off the side that for some reason I can never remember, and it's Federation Metadata. And then 2007-06, and then it is federationmetadata.xml. Thank you very much for whoever reminded me of SSL. All right, so I'm going to test that because I don't trust my ability to type. All right, and that is okay. All right, and so I've gone ahead and I've set up uh, the hard way, the trust, but if your clipboard works, you can simply do copy paste. Now there's two things I have to go in here to change. Um, the first is I need to set my request validation mode to 2.0 for the application. And then for my control to work, my little claims control, I have to save my bootstrap token. So all of that built, the next thing I need to do is go into the access control service um, <clears throat> and I need to configure ACS to issue tokens to my app. Really simple, really straightforward. One of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a series of identity providers. I'm going to set up Google. There, I've set up Google. Uh, how about Yahoo? You guys want to see Yahoo? That works. So I've got three identity providers set up, Google, Yahoo, and Live ID. The next thing I'm going to do is project my application into ACS, and we do that through what we call relying party registration. And so I'm going to give this relying party uh, a name of VSRP. I'm going to enter the addresses. See if copy-paste works. Hey, how about that? Um, you can see that my uh, token format, I have a couple of options to choose from, 2011 or SWT. And then I'm just going to save this. I'm going to accept the defaults there. The last thing I need to do is uh, generate a default policy for that relying party. And I'm just kind of whipping through this pretty quick. Um, but suffice it to say that ACS is now configured to take any data that the uh, identity provider gives it and send it back to the website. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> if I've been living well and I have a, a, a pure heart, this should work with no typos. Let's see, so I hit F5. Now, when I did the add STS reference, one of the things that happened is Windows Identity Foundation configured the site for what's called blanket protection. So there are no URIs that are allowed to be accessed without authentication. 
So you must be authenticated to get to any resource inside the site. And so I'm going to pick an identity provider. How about Google? And I sign in. So the request was sent back to the access control service. The access control service validated that request and then issued a token back to the site. Now this is going to be a little bit gnarly, and it goes off the page. But the idea here is that you get my name as issued by Google, you get my email address as issued by Google, and you get this claimed identifier, which is a unique handle that Google has issued for me for this site that I can use combined with the identity provider to hook into my profile store. How much code did I write? Goose egg. None. Pretty cool, huh? So if there's ever a time to applaud. But wait, there's more. So I want to take this to the next level, and let's say, all right, <clears throat> so maybe your business changes, and you've integrated with Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and, and Live ID, but now you actually want to integrate with a corporate identity provider. I know this is a web conference, but I just, I, I just have to show this. It's too cool, right? So now I'm going to add another identity provider. And just to be slick, I'm going to integrate with Microsoft's corporate ADFS server. Right, so we at Microsoft use our own stuff, right? So we have ADFS set up. Um, and I walk through the creation of the identity provider here. And I'm going to go get that metadata from Microsoft Corp. Let's see if we can get it. Come on. Let's see if I was smart enough to add it here. No, I wasn't. Oh, well. Maybe when this comes back in just a second, I'll show you. I'm going to switch to another demo. Leave that one alone. <laughs> we'll come back to it in a second. So that's how you do website uh, integration. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You can do it without writing much code. Well, how do, you think about the, how do you think about mobile applications? It's a whole other space, right? And so the access control service has a protocol head on it that will work with Windows Phone applications and mobile applications in general. So the idea is pretty simple. Um, out on our CodePlex site, uh, we have a little control that you can add to your XAML, right? And so maybe you've got a little Silverlight application, and it's going to go talk to some back-end services. You need to perform some user authentication before you grant them access to those back-end services. You can add this control to your site and write about 10, 15-ish kind of lines of code that are all shown in CodePlex, and you get this kind of experience inside of your phone app. Right? So when the user needs to sign in, they get to render a page, and that page consists of the data that ACS renders or, or uh, returns in that JSON feed. It's just rendered as a list. And so I can pick Google if that's what I want to use. And the Google page is going to appear. Because you guys can see what I'm typing, I'm using a different account. I log in at Google, right? What happened? The challenge here is ACS did not issue a token. So an error happened. Why didn't ACS issue a token? It's very simple. There was no policy configured there. And so if I go to my relying party applications, or let's say I go to my rule groups, I've got one configured for my Contoso contacts uh, little application here. All I have to do is generate the default policy. And I've got some rules that say take any data from Google or Yahoo and pass it through to my application. And now let's see what happens. So I sign in with Google. I'm not going to be prompted for my credentials again. And what shows up is a data list. So a token is now present on my Windows Phone app, not my Google username and password. A token is present. The app is storing that token and using the token to go get this back-end service. 
This approach works whether you're talking about websites or you're talking about a mobile application that's accessing a service, and you've got one conduit or one thing to help funnel you through the differences in protocol. Right? And that's what we've been shooting for with the access control service. So you see two wildly different use cases where we're coming into play. So hopefully this is starting to resonate and starting to strike a nerve. Now as I add identity, thank you. As I add identity providers or as I configure identity providers inside of ACS, like maybe I go in and I say I want to add, I'm going to try this thing again, this WS Fed identity provider. There it is. For Microsoft Corp. I paste the Fed metadata URL from the Microsoft Corp server. And then I'm going to enter the email address that a user is most likely to use when they try to log into the site. That'll, that'll make sense in a second. I hit save. And now when I go back to my rule groups to avoid the same kind of error, I want to make sure that I generate the policy associated with Microsoft Corp. So I go ahead and generate it. And when I go back to my website, if I log in, I'm going to see a different experience. I haven't touched the website. But rather than a standard set of, of buttons that I can use, I see a split. So do you want to choose one of the consumer identity providers on the left, or do you want to log in with some other uh, server? All right, so I'm going to enter my email address, hit submit. I'm going to be sent to the Microsoft corporate ADFS server. So I'm going to enter my credentials here. And lo and behold, I'm logged into the site. I haven't had to touch the site. I haven't touched the site. And the data, as you can see, got my email address as issued by Microsoft's Corp ADFS server. Kind of cool. All right. So the demo gods were not kind on that one, but I think I showed you what I needed to show you. So now authorization. Authorization is really about what is the user allowed to do. Um, <laughs> this is not a simple topic. Authorization is one of the harder ones that's out there, and I, I believe in the security space. And it gets hard as some stuff happens. So as you have a really, as the, 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 the size or the number of resources that you're trying to control gets bigger, and the resolution of that control gets finer, the problem gets harder. So if you have a document library that, say, has a million documents in it, and you want to be able to individually control the permissions on those million documents, it gets kind of challenging. Just the scope and scale of that can be challenging, right? If you add into that, well, maybe I don't want to just control authorization in one application, but I want to have centralized authorization across four or five different applications. That makes it an interesting problem space as well, right? So this is a hard one, right? Another one is, well, what if I want to take a resource and I want to be able to audit and say who has access to that resource, right? Tell me who has right permission to this particular site. Like, that's a challenging one, too. So is reporting the scope of control that you need and the uh, number of applications you need it across. As those change, this becomes a really hard problem. And that's why I have our man sort of falling into a pool here. And if I could, could have put some alligators in there, I would have. This generally leads to a bunch of over-engineering. So the solutions to this that I've seen out in the wild generally are wildly over-engineered or they're just not successful at all. Now, ACS does not give you yet a holistic over authorization, right? But we can help in some areas, right? And I want to be very candid about where we can help and where we cannot help. ACS does really one thing as it relates to authorization. It can add data to tokens that are sent to your application at login time. So as much can be known about the application or the use of that token ahead of time at login time, we can use that data and add addition, or we, we can use that information and add data to a token so that your app has it. That's about it, right? But that can actually be quite a powerful sort of thing. 
And so we use what are called rules, very simple rules. There's an antecedent and a consequent to a rule, if A, then B. Right? So if A shows up from the identity provider, then we will issue B in a, in a token. Your site or your service can demand a set of claims from ACS before an operation is allowed. So in addition to just knowing about who the user is, you could add permissions or roles into the token that's sent to the site or service. Make sense? Really simple, really trivial view. However, there's some problems with this. You can't put every role into a token. So if you're accessing a REST web service, that token should probably go in an HTTP header. And so if you had, let's say, a thousand roles and you wanted to put them in a token, like that's kind of silly, right? So there's often in authorization context the need to be able to call out to another service to make a decision, some kind of policy decision about is this allowed by this principle? Is this action on this resource allowed by this user? Right? And that, like, we don't have that capability yet in the access control service. All we do is issue tokens. Make sense? And so this could look the following way. If you look at three rules, right? If Google asserts any claim, if Google asserts that my email address is Justin Joseph Smith, if they assert that I like, uh, you know, apple pie, take that data and put it in a token. I don't care what it is. Take anything and put it in a token. That's a rule. Another rule, if Google asserts the email address is justin at gmail.com, then issue a claim of type role where the value is administrator. Take it one step further. If ACS asserts that there is a role claim of administrator, then issue an additional claim of type action where the value is right. And so if you combine these three together and sort of do a mental compilation, you could see how if Google asserts that my email address is justin at gmail.com, I would be given an administrator role claim and I would also be given an action claim where the value is right. Make sense? And so ACS uses this kind of chaining or compilation mechanism when it calculates the, the, the contents of a token that it issues. Sorry. And so this is actually a token that has been generated by a similar set of rules. Now those rules were in English, that's not the format that we store them inside of ACS. It would be great if we could express them as simply as that, those sentences. We're working on it. But this is actually a simple web token. A simple web token is nothing more than a name value set of pairs that are form encoded. And then there's an HMAC SHA-256 signature added on the end. And so what I want to hone in on now are the claims that are up top, right? And so the ones up at, up at the top are the results of rules at the access control service. So there's a couple of ones up at the top. The four at the top are all about identity. So those are really issued by Google. The two below it are issued by permission and role claims. At the access control service, you can see that they're chained together. So the, the holder of this token is an administrator and also has write permission. There's some other claims that are really important as you think about working with this type of service. There's a set of standard claims that ACS will always add to a token that it issues. Some of the names change if you're talking about issuing a SAML 2.0 token versus a simple web token, but they're generally fairly similar. The first is audience. That's the scope of the token. Where is this token intended to be sent? There's a URI there. What's the lifetime of the token? Token. This is an epoch time, right? So it has a discrete expiration time. Who's the issuer of the token? In this case, it's the access control service. And the access control service always emits the full URL into the token, right? So your app can use that to um, validate tokens. And then last but not least, there's the signature, right? And so this is a very simple HMAC SHA-256 algorithm that's run on all the previous fields. And so your app, when it receives one of these things, all it has to do is recalculate the hash. And assumedly, ACS and your app are the only entities that have the secret that was used to generate the hash. Right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I'm going to skip the simple authorization demo. But the idea with simple authorization is really all you have to do in your application is that whatever sort of framework you're using, like let's say you're using WCF for OData or using it for uh, a simple JSON service, all you have to do there is spin up basically a service authorization manager, right? And so you interrogate the claims that are present in the token. If the right claims are present, then you allow the operation. You basically return a true. 
If the right claims are not present, you return a false and maybe emit some kind of error. Really simple. There's a couple things I do want to say about management in the waning minutes of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so when you create your access control service namespace or your own tenant inside of the access control service, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind. You have to name your tenant. Right? This is not a foreign concept inside of Azure, but you give your tenant a unique name. Right? And you also have to pick the region that you want this name to reside. So we have six data centers, two in Europe, two in Asia, and two in the US. And so you pick a, name, a region for your unique name. Right? So if I picked a namespace called walkthrough, .accesscontrol.windows.net, where walkthrough is the name. I have to pick that either in Chicago or San Antonio or Hong Kong or the Netherlands or in Dublin. Right? You get the idea. And the reason that is required is we rely on DNS for routing. So when you make a request into ACS, we rely on that DNS name to route you to the appropriate data center. Really simple, really straightforward. We didn't want to be cutesy or footsy with this, uh, but it works and it's very reliable. There's two ways to manage your ACS service namespace. Uh, there's the API, which adheres to the OData protocol. Anyone familiar with OData? Oh boy, cool, right? <clears throat> and then we have a management portal, right? So we have a web UI for interacting with, uh, with your ACS tenant. Um, <clears throat> a couple things are important. Um, because we're OData compliant, you can use tools like Sesame to interrogate our data model. You can do more in the OData API than you can do through the portal. So the portal is really about just getting started and doing some really simple things. The OData API gives you the richest experience. You can go change a lot of stuff, right? So if you're gonna get hot and heavy into this kind of work, you'll eventually wanna familiarize yourself with the OData API. And this is one of my favorite ideas here. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun to wrestle with, but if you think about authenticating to the ACS portal and you think about authenticating to the OData API, what's the problem set that you got? Put yourself in the shoes of a member of my team. Oh my gosh, how are we gonna authenticate the user? Right? So as soon as you walk up to the portal, it's like, oh, oh okay, what are we gonna, are we gonna have a new username and password? Are we gonna integrate with just live ID? Are we gonna, oh my gosh. Well, we decided to eat our own dog food. Right? So to get into the portal or to get access to the API, you have to go first get a token from the access control service. Right? And so one of the cool things is the portal recursively uses the access control service. The API, the OData API, recursively uses the access control service. And in Sesame, there's tooling that actually allows you to enter your credentials and then go get a token and see the API. It's pretty slick. Right? So this means, like the concrete implementation or the concrete value is, you can give others access to your service namespace. Rather than giving out your Windows Live ID credentials, <laughs> you can add a Gmail address or you can add your corporate ADFS identity and give them access to the service namespace. So if you go get hit by a bus, you know, not that I'm asking you when to get hit by a bus, others have access. Right? We're actually the only service inside of Azure right now that recursively uses this for login. There will be more to come. Right? To me, this, is a, this was a validation of the work that we had done when we actually went to turn this on and we're onboarding more sites. Right? Now, the one downside to this is we don't have rich authorization in what those credentials give you access to. So if you give a friend using their Gmail email address access to your ACS service namespace, they have all or nothing access, right? We haven't gone to that more granular level of control that I was talking about before to say, all right, I'm gonna grant this user access over maybe my rules or some rules or a particular rule, right? So it's all or nothing now, we're working on smoothing that out, okay? One thing I wanna show you before the timer goes off is, has anybody worked with the Sesame data browser? Pretty cool, right? And so <clears throat> if you wanna wa walk through or see the uh, data model that ACS uses, the entities that it has, you can use Sesame and you can, if you pick SQL Azure as the authentication type, 
um, because there's a, a head on SQL Azure that uses this as well, you can enter the address of your management service, enter your credentials for API access, and then enter the STS endpoint down here, and you get access. Right? So you can look at things like what the service keys are. Right? And these are the signing credentials that ACS uses when issuing tokens. Um, you can also look at what the rules are. So if you have, let's say, 20, 30, 40,000 rules, right? You can use this. Uh, you can use this as a pretty simple way to filter rules. Right now, I don't have 20, 30, 40,000 rules, um, but you can see these are the rules that are actually present, right? And so, if I just want to filter through them, I can, right? So I can filter off of input claim type, or I could filter off a particular value. Pretty simple and straightforward. It just kind of works, but you get full read access over this set of data. Now the last thing I'm gonna show you is how you can go configure or give uh, a friend access to this portal, right? So inside the portal, there's a little tab here that says, do you wanna set up portal administrators? So you can say yes, all right, here's an identity provider. If Google asserts that my email address is justinjosephsmith at gmail.com, then they're a portal administrator. Save, bam. Right? Now, because I have configured my service to work with Microsoft Corp, then I could say if Microsoft asserts my email address is just an SM at Microsoft.com, I can get in. Right? And we reuse that Home Realm Discovery, so when you go to this URL, right, we show you that Home Realm Discovery page, click a button or enter your email address, and you'll be authenticated to get access. Make sense? All right. There's a bunch more that I'd love to show you around ACS. Uh, there's the whole OAuth API that we have. So we embrace OAuth 2 draft 13, not draft 12. We just did the update. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, some more work that we're thinking of doing around protocols, like the SAML protocol, uh, and even updating OAuth to what the next version of OAuth is. We want to embrace more uh, token formats, things like a JSON web token. We've been working with Google on that. Clearly, richer authorization is going to be important, and it is important, not only for our services and our site, but also we want to make it available for you when you're building your applications. There's some Home Realm discovery improvements that we're thinking about. Um, we want to give you more management tooling, better ways to search through rules, better ways to roll keys and all that kind of stuff. And then last but not least, we're also looking at gaining better adoption inside the platform so that hopefully at one point, you'll be able to auth with an Azure service using one single mechanism. Make sense? So these are just some of the things that we're thinking about. One point I'd like to make is the access control service as it stands today is based off the feedback that you guys have given the team directly. And so I want to encourage you guys to continue to tell us what you want and what you need and some of the problems that you're having. And we'll work very quickly to try to roll that into the service to build what I believe is going to be another great version here pretty soon. So there's some resources that you guys have to go learn more about ACS. All of our samples are out on CodePlex, right? So acs.codeplex.com. Vittorio has put together a fantastic set of materials in his ID element show. There's a whole identity training kit that shows a lot of stuff around uh, the Access Control Service and Windows Identity Foundation. Our docs are on MSDN. I encourage you to go check those out. And we also have a team blog when we're doing updates in our sandbox or we're doing updates in our production environment, that's where we send those emails and we start to give feature lists, right? So again, I'd like to thank you guys for taking the time today to uh, listen and hear and talk about identity. If you've got any questions, comments, or personal attacks, I'm gonna stick around for a little while and be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Any questions? So go to the previous slide. This one. OK. Any other questions? Yes. Um, before, when you said that you had uh, different unique identifier coming from Google based on site, right? Yes. I said, so the, the question you're asking is, I, I, I said that Google gave you a unique ID per RP. Yes. Oh, so that's per RP. Yes. Where the so RP if you is have multiple sites, Authenticating through ACS, through the same ACS service. Yes. And you're building your own profile store. Yes. 
same person is going to look like two different people. I don't in. understand the question. If I have site A and site B, they're both authenticating through ACS. The same ACS tenant, the yes. Same ACS. Um, and one person comes in. Because Google uh, assigns a unique identifier per relying party, is that same person going to look like two different people? No, it looks like the same person because the RP to Google is actually ACS. Okay, that was, that was the question. No, uh, he's asking a different question. No, I, that's it. I didn't know whether the RP was being forwarded through ACS to Google, so no. to Google it looks like one RP. Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Thanks. In two different days, the same person signs on using two different identity providers, they won't look the same to the app. So the, so the question you're asking is if, I, if the same person logs in in two different days with two different identities, it's, it, it is not the same handle from the identity right. provider, correct? Yes, what you need is a federated cloud directory to do that, yeah. Does anybody have one? Does anybody have one? Yeah. I'm not allowed to comment. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great question, by the way. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, we have a... Yeah. We have a system that has mobile clients that are both WinPhone, Android, and iPhone as well as uh, web, ASP.NET, and Silverlight. In your current incarnation, do you see any problem using ACS for all of those platforms? No. The, there, well, there is going to be a problem. I don't think it's a blocking problem. So the, the problem is as follows. When, in, in the interaction that you saw, ACS returns a token to the browser, and then at that point, we issue so we, we've written some script that is kind of unique to the way Silverlight works. And so if you want to integrate with ACS from, let's say, Android or, or one of the iDevices, then you probably wouldn't use that mechanism. You would use the default mechanism, and you would just have to catch the, res the, the, the response. So you would want to validate that there's a 200 and there's a token there. You take that HTML, you find the token, and then you grab it and you don't follow a redirect, right? So it's, it's, it's not much code, but it's a little foreign at first. Um, and that's in lieu of us doing additional protocol work to make it easier on Android and iPhone. So you could use what you had today. You'd probably just have to open up like HTTP Watch or Fiddler or yeah. you know, Firebug just to watch what the interaction is, but it's really simple. Are you planning on adding any examples for the other platforms? Because that's where it gets kind of tricky when you get outside yeah. of... No, that's a... That, that, I am happy to put together a sample on Android. So like I, I can take that as an action item and I, I, I can put it on CodePlex. How about Appreciated. that? Appreciate it. Yep, that's a great question. You can go to the mic. If you want. Is, yep. it, is it possible to you know, have like a native Silverlight login that talks to ACS so that we can kind of bypass this whole iframe kind of thing that's going on? Yeah, so the question is possibly um, the model that we have right now relies on HTTP 302s, right? So, so the, the login mechanism kind of relies on the behavior of the browser. Uh, and we, rather than rebuild all of that in a different UI with a fancy control, it seems like the shortest friction is to just use the web browser control. Um, what we may be able to do is put something together like a sample that would do some of that, but the protocols that we're using are inherently reliant on HTTP 302s and the behavior that it, that it that comes along with that in browsers. Yeah, I, I mean, I get that. I guess just from a cohesive user experience standpoint, it's kind of you know wacky when you know you're in you know a very Windows Phone seven uh, user interface, and then you just all of a sudden get this web. Yeah. You know, UX on well, top you, of it. So the, the point that I think you're bringing up is I want to have control over the entire user experience. And if a user is going to Google or Live ID or Facebook, maybe not Facebook, but certainly Google and Live ID and Yahoo, they actually want the user to know they're at Google or Yahoo or Live ID because you can fish an identity pretty easily otherwise. And so there's, there's sort of a tug of war here. It's the requests that you're asking for 
along with what those identity providers have to have to maintain the integrity of their system. And so that's one reason why, like, with OpenID, there's not kind of an active sort of federation where you can just send the username and password over the wire. Over the wire. You have to kind of rig it up through the browser. Okay. Will do. So I, I'm going to uh, walk off stage, but I'll hang out over here. I've run out of time. I'm sorry I ran a little long, guys. But I'll, I'll hang around for as long as needed. Thank you.